Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our sermon text for today follows right behind the sermon text from last Sunday, continuing a sequence of conversations that Jesus had with his disciples. Both of these texts deal with a basic aspect of Christian character and Christian behavior, how Christians are to behave toward their fellow sinful human beings. Last Sunday we heard that one of the basic trademarks of Christian living is that we are always seeking to save lost sinners, including our brothers and sisters right here in this church. Not that they are lost in sin, but whenever we see them drift away, perhaps into a a pattern of sinful living or action. Today, the emphasis of Jesus' teaching is on our own attitude toward those sinful human beings, especially when the sins that they commit directly affect us, when we ourselves are the people who have been sinned against. Human beings often tend to practice a double standard, that is, to make one kind of judgment when the person being hurt is somebody else, but to make a different judgment when we ourselves are the victims of transgression. That's different, we might say, when we are the ones getting hurt. But Jesus says it shouldn't be different. We urge others to have a forgiving spirit. Let's do that same thing ourselves. So today, we focus on another basic Christian trademark always ready to forgive. The most obvious lesson that we learn from our text for today is that for Christians, there is no limit to how often we should be willing to forgive someone who sins against us. Now, the Apostle Peter had been listening very closely to Jesus' instructions that we heard in the Gospel reading last Sunday regarding Christian discipline what to do when a brother or sister in Christ is caught up in a pattern of sin. And Jesus taught that first we should go to that person and confront them about their sin lovingly, humbly, one-on-one, in private. And then if that person does not listen and repent, then we should take one or two others along, fellow Christians, to similarly encourage that person to repent of their sin and turn back to Jesus and to following God's ways. And that if that person refuses to listen to those two or three people, then we should bring the matter before the whole church. And then the whole church will together approach that person and encourage them to repent of their sinfulness, their sinful way of living, to turn back to Jesus in faith for forgiveness and to following God's ways. And that if that person then even refuses to listen to the church, we should treat them as an unbeliever rather than as a Christian because that's what their actions and their refusal to repent demonstrate. Now, Peter had been listening very closely to those directions, and he caught the spirit of that message. He realized that the goal, as Jesus taught, is not to punish sinners or to publicly shame them, but to bring them to repentance and to an appreciation of the forgiveness of sins that God has already provided through Jesus, God's never-failing love because of his Son and what he did for us on the cross. Peter suddenly realized that followers of Jesus must be forgiving people if they want others to understand the wonder of God's forgiveness and God's love toward them. Peter's next question shouldn't really surprise anyone. It's such a human question. And I suspect that most of us have probably asked a similar question to the one that Peter asks in our relationships with others. Perhaps without even realizing that it was the Apostle Peter who asked that question first. We all know that as Christians we should forgive those who sin against us especially when they ask us for forgiveness. But what might often puzzle us is how often, how many times we should say, I forgive you. 
when the other person just keeps sinning against us again and again. Peter doesn't only ask the question. He offers what many people might consider to be not only a reasonable, but in fact a very generous answer. How about seven times? Surely that would be more than enough times to forgive someone when they sin against me. That would more than fulfill our obligation to be patient, tolerant, and forgiving, wouldn't it? We can almost feel ourselves nodding our heads in agreement with Peter. Anyone who has been injured or hurt or insulted or mistreated by another person again and again gets the point of saying, okay, that's enough. I've given you all these chances. This is the end of the rope. I've had it with you. Forgive you again? Forget it. This is why the response of Jesus to Peter is so startling and why, from that response, we learn so much about the nature of Christianity from it. Jesus replies, I'm telling you, seven times is not enough, not nearly enough. If you want to practice forgiveness according to my spirit of forgiveness, then you must forgive that person 77 times. In other words, you must forgive them without ceasing, without end. A trademark of your being my disciple must be always ready to forgive. It's interesting that human nature, also in us Christians, keeps trying to find ways to get around or to water down the absoluteness of this principle that Jesus lays out especially when we are confronted with applying it to situations in our own daily lives. One thing that we like to say or or think is, okay, I'll forgive you this time, but don't expect me to forget about it. We want to allow ourselves the luxury of at least keeping a little grudge against that person, a, a record in our memories of what they have done against us. But when we do that, that prevents us from taking the forgiven offender back 100% into our good graces, into a restored relationship with us. That keeps that other person who has offended us hanging over the ledge of possible rejection from us in the future. First, we appear to give the gift of forgiveness to the person who has sinned against us, But then we take part of that forgiveness away by refusing to forget about the offense. Jesus' simple comment to us when we do that would be, that is not enough. This is not a case where half a loaf is better than none. In this case, partial forgiveness is like no forgiveness at all. If God did that to us, where would we be? We would be lost. Only forgiveness that covers all of our sin fully and forever can unlock the gates of eternal life with God in heaven for us. And only when that forgiveness that we grant to our offending neighbor is total, unrestricted, and without strings attached does it really reflect the pattern of Christ's forgiveness to us. What a wonderful gift that God gives us when he fills us with such a spirit of full and free forgiveness. It makes us always ready to forgive, just as God is always ready to forgive us. It doesn't count the number of offenses. There is to be no limit to the frequency of or the fullness of our forgiveness. As the Apostle Paul wrote to the Christians in the city of Ephesus in our second lesson for today. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ has forgiven us. A second lesson that this text then teaches us is that the basis and source of a forgiving spirit in people is the incredibly kind and gracious forgiving spirit of our God towards us.
Only this forgiveness from God can move us always to be ready to forgive others. The parable that Jesus tells in our gospel reading today depicts a man who never learned this important and wonderful lesson. As a result, he is a blatant hypocrite in regard to forgiveness. When he couldn't pay that huge debt that he had piled up against his master, he begged for mercy and for the master to forgive the debt. He realized that he was liable to being sold together with his whole family into slavery. It was an awful prospect for him to think about, so he pled for forgiveness from the master. And the amazing thing is that the master granted his request and wiped away that whole huge debt. It was an act of generosity so huge that we would expect that servant to say, I will never, ever forget this. And I will certainly also be merciful and compassionate to everyone else that I meet. But, as we see in the parable, exactly the opposite of that happens. When a fellow servant then asked that man for mercy in connection with a far smaller debt that he owed him, the first servant refused and had that guy who owed him just a little bit of money thrown into prison until he could pay the last penny. It's an unbelievably crass example of hypocritical behavior. Expecting mercy for himself, but refusing to grant that mercy to someone else. When we first hear this parable, it sounds unreal. Who could do that kind of thing? Yet anyone who examines human behavior must soon become aware of the fact that double standards have been around for a long, long time and are still around today, even here in the church. We tell our children not to use bad language, but then we go and do it ourselves. We send our children to Sunday school while we instead go out for brunch. We lament the opioid crisis in our society and other drug problems in the world around us, but then we proceed to abuse food and alcohol. We condemn corrupt politicians in our society, but then we try to justify bending the rules and cheating on our taxes. We denounce people who subtract from the truth of God's word in order to excuse their sinful behavior or the sinful behavior of others. But then we add our own human ideas and traditions as if they were God's commands, which is just as bad. Hypocritical behavior is reprehensible no matter in what way it happens. But when it happens in regard to forgiveness, it strikes at the very heart of what Christianity is all about. Strange to say, not everyone in the world would fault that unmerciful servant for his behavior. Sometimes people of the world think that being forgiving makes a person weak and easy to be taken advantage of. Some people in society would praise the virtue of this person who, like steel, refuses to bend and insists on getting his rights even when it brings suffering into someone else's life. The unmerciful servant in the parable would have been popular with people who feel that way, But obviously, he was not popular with Jesus. Jesus clearly was opposed to both the hypocrisy and that uncaring spirit. Jesus knew the dreadful consequences of each. When we consider the last verse of our reading before us today, it's difficult to think about a statement of judgment in the Bible that is more harsh and severe. The climax of the parable shows the unmerciful servant back before his master who angrily puts him away in jail and says, don't let him out until he has paid every penny of the debt. And then comes Jesus' application of this story to the lives of his disciples. It's an inescapable lesson that all of us should never forget. Jesus says, 
This is what my heavenly Father will do to you unless each one of you forgives his brother from his heart. Is it possible that this word of our Lord comes across to us as unnecessarily harsh and strict? Yeah, it is. We have a way of forgetting how forgiving God is. Over and over again, we sin against him. Over and over again, we hurt his loving heart. When he doesn't cater to our every desire and want, how easily we turn our backs on him and turn instead to money or pleasure to get what we want. When life's fortunes go against us, how quickly we accuse God and blame him for the misfortunes that we are experiencing when we get obsessed with the worries and pleasures of this world, how frequently we shut our ears to God's voice and we fail to seek guidance and direction from his word. Yet every time we fold our hands to pray, open God's word to read, go to God's house to worship, approach God's altar to eat and drink his sacred and life-giving food, Our hearts cry out to him, forgive our sins. And every time, no doubt it's thousands and thousands of times in the average Christian's lifetime, God always responds positively. He always gives the same comforting, blessed answer. Yes, I forgive you. I forgive you fully, with no strings attached. I do this for the sake of Jesus, your Savior. Is it impossible to overstate how wonderful this is? The generous, loving, caring, forgiving nature of our God cannot be fully described with words. We deserve nothing, absolutely nothing good from God. Yet God gives us everything. We are damnable sinners. Yet in Christ, God declares us to be saints. We break every law in God's book and deserve to be cast into eternal darkness. Yet God, through the redemptive work of his Son, adopts us into his family, showers us with his kindness and every blessing, writes our names into his will, and eventually will give us his home to live in eternally. It is critical that we never start taking God's forgiving love for granted. Only when we daily experience a profound sense of gratitude for how incredibly merciful our God is toward us can we then begin to practice such limitless forgiveness toward our fellow human beings. May the Holy Spirit use this message of God's love for us to cultivate in us a pattern of behavior that more and more reflects the seeking, seeking to save others and the willing to forgive spirit 